Welcome to another episode of Courageous Conversations Live. I'm your host, Pierre Quinn, and here on Courageous Conversations, we're leveraging the stories of leaders, of creatives, of entrepreneurs to help you live and lead with greater courage. And I'm so excited for this episode because joining me in the spot for 20 minutes or less is Lisa Willis. Lisa, thanks for being my guest today. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I know we're going to enjoy this conversation. And as our friends are are stopping the scroll on social media, hey, if you're hanging out with us now or the replay, hop in the comment section. Let us know you're watching. We'd love to give you a shout out. If you got a question for Lisa, I know you're going to have one. Even if the question is in the replay, drop that question in there. We'll make sure she gets it. And also, listen, we want to help out as many leaders as we can. And we do that by leveraging what you bring to the table. So go ahead and hit that share button so that you don't keep all of this good stuff to yourself. Okay, Lisa, start us off. Give us that that 60 second version. If we were in Starbucks and I turned around and asked you what you did, that elevator pitch version of who you are and what you do. Sweet. So I would say that my nine to five is working at Nike as an associate product line manager um, for men's basketball. So I work on uniforms uh, and team gear from NCAA men's to G League to USA basketball. But my five to nine is my passion work. And that's where I um, I take all my experiences as a gold medalist, as a professional basketball player, a high level um, athlete at UCLA. <clears throat> and I help people bring out the performance that really, the high level performance that really lives inside of them. Um, I help people with their mindsets. I help them with their emotional state all to help better their performance and whatever it is that they're doing. So at the end of the day, I, I want people to appreciate and value their past experiences and leverage them moving forward. Okay. So let's hop, let's hop in the time, time machine. Cause there's a lot that we can pull from, even from that cliff notes version of your story. Let's hop back in the time machine. And when did it, when did it click for you that you had the potential to be you know, not just an athlete, not just a pretty good player, not just, you know, a decent person on the court. When did it really click for you that you you got the potential to become a high performance athlete? Like, when did you first make that connection? Oddly enough, this is going to sound really crazy, but oddly enough, I was about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Like I started off playing basketball and I was pretty good when I played, but I was playing YMCA, Parks and Recs, things of that level. Then I tried to level up and play for a travel team. And I literally left the gym running, crying, like longest ride. That was the longest 20 minute ride home I ever experienced in my life. And it was just complete failure. Like I was not prepared to level up <clears throat> at that time. And so I went home and I worked on my game. Like oftentimes we know the stuff that brings us anxiety. Mm -hmm. So for a nine year old girl, doing a left-hand layup brought me anxiety. I would go to the other side of the court. And so, you know, I just wrote out a workout, tracked my workout, and about a year later, I tried out for the team and I made it. And it was that experience that really started my relationship off with hard work. And so kind of taking that, like, okay, work hard, get the result, work hard, get the result. That mindset um, or that lifestyle, I should say, has been with me since I was nine years old and somewhere around the age of 13, I was like, yo, I might be, I might be kind of nice. <laughs> so, okay. So I got, I got to ask you because you, you know, from, from the coaching and you've coached at all levels, uh, leaders, entrepreneurs, other athletes, what was it about it for you? Was it something in the family line? Was it somebody you saw in the neighborhood? Was it a book that you read a television show? What was it that said, okay, Lisa, you ran home crying because because that would that that tryout that practice was trash. You ran home crying, but you're going home and going to work instead of saying, which some of us do, I'm gonna run home and never do this again. Right. What was it for you? Can, was there like a catalyst, something that you saw, or was it just like something was built into you into into your spirit to be like, nah, we don't end here. Yeah, um, I always attribute my success to the love of the game. Mm. Like I never wanted to go to the WNBA. I never aspired to be on the USA team. 
It was my love for the game that just had me trying to be better and better and better, you know? And so that was what it was. That was, <laughs> that was like a traumatic situation for me. I was nine, like you know, I was playing with 13 year olds. Like that was traumatizing for me, but my love for the game is what made me say, okay, we can't, we can't, you know, let it in here. And then I didn't like that feeling, that feeling like oftentimes, you know, people don't want us to be emotions, but emotional, but our emotions are important. We just have to know how to channel them and make something great of it. I hated that feeling. Like I said, that was the longest 20 minute ride home. Mm. I hated it. I didn't want to feel it again. And so I had to do something about it. You go from you know, just years of basketball success, top one of the top picks in the WNBA draft to if you fast forward it in that narrative a little later coming to the realization, man, injury. I can't compete at the level that I've been used to competing on so long. And for, uh, for some people that becomes another one of those pivotal moments where I say, man, I'm just going to give up altogether on everything. What, what did you translate maybe from the nine-year-old you, maybe from the UCL AU maybe from the professional success you, what did you translate from those experiences to help you pivot to who you who you started to become uh, after playing the game at such a high level? Yeah, um, when, when that injury happened, that career ending injury happened, it was very difficult to move forward because I was telling myself all the right things, but I wasn't feeling the grief. And I wasn't feeling the loss. So I told myself I need to get another job. Mm. This is understanding and feeling the, the fact that this was my first love, my longest relationship, my happy place, my job, my workout, my social life. It was all of these things. I simply said, you know, uh, I went to the scriptures like God wanted to take me this far. He has everything under control. Mm -hmm. Like and I, I kind of went surface level instead of really feeling that. Once I was able to actually say, you know what, this sucks. And that was like three years later. You know, once I was able to say like, this sucks, like I miss basketball. I love basketball. Um, then I was able to start the process. It was a long process. Start the process of, of healing and trying to figure out, well, why was I in denial of my relationship and my love for the game? And that started on a whole journey of self uh, self-discovery and self-awareness. And from that, I was able to pull situations from YMCA, UCLA, high school, the W, um, that made me into the person that I was so or that I am so that I could appreciate my relationship with basketball and move forward. Now, speaking of moving forward, you have some in incredible success. I mean, OK, so I'm from Michigan. And that means I have a natural affinity to the basketball team in Michigan. We, we won't mention them right now because as we're recording this, it just hasn't been a good couple of years. Gotcha. <laughs> My wife, however, is from the state of New York. Not only is my wife from New York, uh, my LinkedIn coach, YB Youngblood, is also from New York who's checking in with us uh, on, on LinkedIn Live. There's a team in New York, and, and you got some historic uh, first as a part of your connection to this, this one of the basketball teams in New York. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, uh, I, was, I was privileged to be the first woman to coach in the New York Knicks franchise. Um, I did some work with the New York Knicks, but I was assigned to the Westchester Knicks, which is their G League or like minor league team. And it was just awesome, you know, between uh, the time that I retired to taking that position. It had been 10 years of me, you know, training and developing players from the inside out, um, employees, uh, teams, you know, and so by the time I got there, with the Knicks, I was able to obviously teach them a lot about basketball. Um, you think that, you know, they're professionals, what can you teach? Mm -hmm. um, really gets down to the details at that point. So I was really able to teach them a lot of things about basketball, but it was the mental and emotional care and support that I gave them that really helped it translate to the court. And so all my work, all my just studying, you know, it all paid off once I got 
to the next. And I was able to get players to do things that they couldn't even imagine themselves doing. If if someone had told you, maybe at the high, maybe at UCLA, if someone had told you, okay, Lisa, you, you know, you, you, you kill, you killing it. Seriously, you're killing it. Uh, but the next, we fast forward the next eight years, you're going to be more coach than player. How would you have responded uh, at that point? Was, was that like anything on your horizon? Could you see that? Was it a glimpse of that? Or would you have said, nah, that's, that's not happening. I'm still, I'm still killing the game as a player. And that's where I see myself. Yeah, I probably would have Googled Lisa Willis and said, hey, this is probably the Lisa Willis that you're talking about. <laughs> this Lisa Willis right here is going to be an attorney for a couple of years and then a judge. So I, I had no like that wasn't on my radar playing in the W, not until my senior season. So I would have been like, yeah, you got the wrong Lisa Willis. But there's a lot of us out there. So yeah. maybe the wires are getting mixed up. For individuals who may be like you in that space where there's there's a lane in front of them and maybe they don't they don't see themselves being in that spot or recognize their potential or maybe they're just flat out scared because they they recognize uh, coaches or even outside of athletics that they have some a real opportunity to do something great. But they're looking at that great spot and thinking it might it might take too much of me or I don't know if I could handle it there. At some point, you believed it and leaned into it. What would you say to those people who are on the edge of whatever success or greatness looks like for them as a leader and are still hesitant to lean forward into that actual opportunity? Yeah, I mean, if if you don't believe in yourself, if you don't think that you can do it, nobody else can bring you along. That doesn't mean nobody else will believe in you, mm. but you're the engine. And so there's a lot of things where people tell me like, oh, you'd be so great at this. You could kill this. Like this is you all day has your name on it. But until and these are people who have the uh, ability to bring me along. Mm -hmm. But until I, you know, undig my heels from the ground, I'm not going to be able to move. And so, I mean, everybody has a different journey. I never wanted to be a coach, but you know, me just following my passion, doing what I was good at, doing the things that brought me joy, eventually led me to being a coach. That was that was not how I saw it, but that was how God saw it. But I had to actually act. So if you're not going to lean into whatever it is that's really tugging you, you still have to act. And when you your actions, even if it's not in that direction, eventually you'll get there. Uh, and I mean, that might just take a little bit longer, but you'll get there because that's where your heart is pulling you. It's, it's your mind that's telling you to go the other way, but your heart, that's what's pulling you over there. That's why you're even having a conversation with yourself about it. So if we look at your narrative, we go to your website, lisacwillis.com. We, we see that your heart has pulled you in different directions as well. And one of those directions is the the speaking, training, consulting, and coaching outside of athletics, coaching leaders about mindset and success and resilience. How did that part of, of who you are develop? And was it something that you kind of just jumped into or were you hesitant uh, to, pursue, to pursue that as well? Yeah, since college, I wanted to be uh, a professional speaker. And so I would do like high school banquets and stuff like that. And I just really loved being on that stage. But as I got more serious about it, the the passion and the drive came from who I was as an athlete. I was a really good player, but I was not athletic at all. So I had to be smarter than everybody. You know, I had to think I was a really good defensive player guarding players who were athletically better than me. And so I had to think steps ahead of them, you know? And so just my mindset on how to be successful when I feel like I'm kind of, you know, three steps behind, that's what catapulted me or my mindset. And it's like, okay, well, it doesn't matter if you're starting behind, like this is how you can be successful. And I mean, that's the mental side of it, but the emotional side of it is I didn't feel valued. And that's the worst thing is to not feel valued. And so I wanted to make sure 
that the people that I work with, they feel valued. If they don't feel valued from anybody else, they feel valued within. That's that's where it initially starts, you know. And so just it's it's hard. It's interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, to be in this situation and to feel this way when you're such a high level athlete. But that should speak volumes to just some of the struggles that we go through. And so I just whether I was training a player or training you know, a cohort or, you know, doing a workshop at the end of the day, you need to feel valued so that you can perform at your highest level. In the the personal development space, the leadership development space, because it kind of all kind of coalesces on each other. If you could give us an example of a time where you were, were coaching a player on mindset or you gave a keynote or you did a workshop or a basketball camp, any one of the myriad of experiences that you've had, and you've, you walked away from that experience saying to yourself, yep, this exchange, this outcome, this conversation, this, this company, this, this endorsement, this is the reason why, or one of the reasons why I do what I do. What, what's one of those stories? Yeah, it was with uh, it was with one of my players on the Knicks. And you don't really know the impact you have until later. Mm. And so, um, you know, you know, like, yo, I, I told him, like, I laid it out that we are good. You should pay me for that. You know, I'll, I'll have my secretary bill you. <laughs> but it was a conversation where. Sometimes our words don't line up with our actions. And so this particular player, he was talking about how, you know, he wants to make it to the NBA and um, provide for his family. And, you know, he doesn't want his girl to have to want for anything. And this is a 22 year old boy. So his language was colorful. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but he's telling me all this stuff and I'm it's because I'm digging. And so because I could see something in him but I knew he wasn't putting out his best effort. And so just talking to him about just what that actually means. So you want to make it to the NBA. Okay. So what does that mean for you today? And so why do you want to do that? And just having this conversation, helping him to see, it wasn't necessarily anything I said. It was more so me kind of leading him <clears throat> to, um, to discover what he, what his heart really desired in the first place. Um, we left that conversation. We were on the airplane. So we left that conversation, went our separate ways. The next day he was in the gym. It was an off day. He was in the gym working out and the GM, the other assistant coaches are like, how did you get him to come to the gym? And that was huge for me because one, this guy wasn't coming to the, to the gym, but it wasn't like I had to tell him, you need to be in the gym if you want to play. No, you're already playing. But for the goals that you said that you want to achieve, this is the way that you told me that you would get there. And so to see him actually take a step in the right direction for himself, I just facilitated the conversation. That was huge for me because this means more money. This means, you know, a better work ethic, a better opportunity so that he can reach his goals. I mean, you, you've performed at the highest level, the highest levels of the game, gold medal winner. I mean, the whole, the whole, the whole nine. How how common is that? And even outside of the sports arena, how common is it for you to encounter people who have tons of potential, tons of talent, but they're just like one or two small adjustments away from really taking it to the next level and maximize maximizing the opportunity before before them? How common is that occurrence for you? Yeah, believe it or not, that's very common. That's very common. The issue is that somewhere along the way, they stopped believing in themselves. Somewhere along the way, they became jaded with, with what their life has been. And so they no longer think that they deserve that. Like it wasn't until maybe, I was definitely an adult when I realized that some people are afraid of success. Mm. And I'm like, all I want is success. How could you be afraid of it? Yeah. But you know, your life changes and you have to keep it up. And the failure that comes after you've reached success, that's that's a big one, you know? And so I think that there's so many people who are great at so many different things. And one thing I talk to like high school students about is um, 
if you like balloons, you literally can be an entrepreneur. You can have a business for balloons. There's a whole market for anything that you want to do. And so in answering your question, there's so many people who have random skills, random gifts that if they just believe that they should do this, if they believe that they could and they deserve the success that came with it, they would be killing it. Listen, listen, folks, you just one one changing thought, one belief system, one value system away from being able to crush it and crush that opportunity that's, that's sitting before you. I got I got to ask you, Lisa, before I let you go, I call it shameless plug time of the Courageous Conversations live. I want to know who needs to reach out to you, who needs to go to Lisa C. Willis dot com, uh, who needs to send you a, a, a connection email you know, what types of companies and clients are, are you serving these days and that you're looking to connect with? Yeah. So first of all, I think everybody needs to read my book. My book is called When the Buzzer Sounds. Um, you can get it at my on my website, lisacwillis.com backslash the dash buzzer. And every, it's, it's a book about self-discovery, self-awareness through the lens of sports. And so I'm talking about deep issues like worth versus value, identity versus role, but it's in an easily digestible manner with with the section at the end to really personalize it and reflect. Um, Like I said, it's written through the lens of an athlete, but so many non-athletes are like, yo, chapter 12, like set me free. So I think everybody needs to read that book. And then um, when it comes to speaking and workshops, um, I definitely want... um, like associations to reach out to me. Like if it's a, if it's a venue, let's say an athletic venue, an arena, something of that nature, you already have the sports in mind. Uh, Like let's say it's the Staples Staples Center. I would love for the Staples Center to reach out to me to help their employees get going. So um, any kind of athletic venue, please come my way. Um, any kind of corporation where it's it's predicated on high performance and you don't you're trying to switch your culture up so that you're not micromanaging your employees but instead you have a uh, I call it the training camp uh, the training camp kind of culture where you just want a time where your employees can learn and grow in a short amount of time so that they can produce as the season goes on. Uh, please contact me. Uh, this what I'm talking about is about a mind change, a mind shift, and empowering people to do their best work. So, if your organization needs that, if you're a conference coordinator and you need to get a group of people, uh, not rah rah pumped up, but you want them to leave with tools to be better, please hit me up. I love it. Lisa, thanks so much. I want to thank you in advance because there are going to be people that reach out to you. They're going to go to Lisa C. Willis.com. They're going to get a copy of your book. They're going to hit you up on LinkedIn. They're going to send you a connection email. I want to thank you in advance for the transformation that will happen as a result of that connection. And I also want to thank you for being such a great guest on Courageous Conversations Live today. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll talk again soon. Okay. Thank you.